Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Billy Wilder Theater. I'm Claudia Bester. I'm the Director of Public Programs here at the Hammer Museum, and I'm so pleased to welcome you to today's talk by maestro James Conlon. Now, everyone who knows me knows I am a huge fan of the LA Opera, and I always see every production they do there. And to have the brilliant conductor and musical director of the LA Opera, James Conlon, here today is really a great honor. James Conlon is one of the today's most versatile and respected conductors and one of classical music's most recognized public figures. Since his debut with the New York Philharmonic in 1974, Maestro Conlon has appeared with virtually every major North American and European symphony orchestra and many of the world's major opera companies. He's been associated for more than 30 years with the Metropolitan Opera. He's conducted at La Scala in Milan, the Royal Opera in Covent Garden in London, the Lyric Opera of Chicago, and the Maggio Musicale Fiorentino in Florence. He served as the music director of the city of Cologne, Germany, the Rotterdam Philharmonic, the Ravinia Festival, and the Cincinnati May Festival, as well as the LA Opera. He's also the principal conductor of the RAI National Symphony Orchestra in Torino, Italy. Among numerous prizes, he's received four Grammy Awards for recordings with LA Opera. For nine years before we poached him to come here to LA, Maestro Conlon was the director of the Paris Opera, for which he was presented the Legion of, Ar of Honor by then President Jacques Chirac. Today, Maestro Conlon is at the hammer to talk about the trailblazing American composer, William Grant Still, and the Austrian refugee composer, Alexander Zemlinsky. Conlon, through his Recovered Voices series, has long championed works by composers whose careers and lives were suppressed by the Nazi regime in Europe, and he's expanded the circle of Recovered Voices to encompass other marginalized composers as well. The LA Opera is unveiling a new production on February 24th. It's a double feature with William Grant Still's opera, Highway One, and the Alexander Zemlinsky opera, The Dwarf, featuring an extraordinary cast of singers, including tenor Roderick Dixon, who is here with us today. Roderick, you want to give a little wave? There he is. So thrilling to have you. I got to see you in The Dwarf back um, in 2008, I think it was, and I'm very excited to see you again in a few weeks. Um, I am perhaps missing a page, but perhaps not. Anyway, the LA Opera is generally, generously offering today's audience and all Hammer members a 20% discount on evening tickets to see these important works, and we will have flyers for the discount in the theater lobby after today's talk, and it will also be in an email um, to the Hammer Weekly newsletter, so please make sure you are signed up for that. I have my tickets already. Make sure you get yours. After today's talk, I want to invite all of you to a reception with Maestro Conlon and Roderick Dixon, if he has time, um, in the event space that is just right next to the theater, to the right when you go out the door. Um, they will be there to say hello and happy to answer any other questions you have after the talk. So please join us. And without further ado, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Maestro James Conlon. Good afternoon uh, out there. Uh, I personally thank each and every one of you and hope to do so at the reception afterwards because I know that you are courageous. How do I know that you are courageous? Because you have come out on a rainy day in Los Angeles. Uh, uh, this harks back to a memory I have before I came to Los Angeles Opera. Uh, just after the millennium, I uh, gave a, uh, since, I mean, you know this is about recovered voices and we'll be right at, getting right into that shortly. Uh, I gave a performance in the Wilshire uh, uh, Boulevard Temple of a work that was written by uh, a composer, Victor Ullmann, in the internment camp of Terezin. And it, I was very happy to be able to do this in that beautiful setting with the Los Angeles Philharmonic and a excellent cast, and uh, it rained that night. And so there was a very small crowd. And my friends of many years took me out to dinner and said, we just have to explain something about Los Angeles. Uh, when it rains in Los Angeles, people go home, get into bed, and pull the covers over their head 
and stay there until the rain is over. Now, I hope you have something to eat because this is going to last a few days, but I'm very grateful that you are the courageous ones who have come out here. And uh, if you in enjoy the talk, uh, please let all of your friends know that it will be going up online, I think, within a day or two. And so uh, everything that uh, we're going to talk about and discuss uh, will be will be available to the general public. And so um, actually... Uh, tell them as they spend the next few days in bed to, to uncover their heads and to take a look at it, uh, go online and have a, have a good look at it. Uh, so as you can see up here, uh, there are three people. Uh, I'm obviously the one in the middle. Uh, this is William Grant Still on the left. And that, of course, is Alexander Zemlinsky uh, on the right. And they are the protagonists of today's uh, conversation. Uh, this is a collection of photos of composers whom uh, we call, uh, we, I, LA Opera, have coined a term, recovered voices. Who are they? What are they? These are composers who whose works are relatively neglected. Now, that doesn't mean they're unknown, and it doesn't mean their names have never been heard of. And fortunately, in the course of the last 30 years, which is the time that I have spent uh, in, part well, part not just participating, but really a, a, a mission I took upon myself, uh, there's, there is a lot of movement and a lot of, uh, a, a lot of growth. Uh, th but these are all composers who would be household names, who would be a part of the classical music uh, canon. I, I am a classical musician, and consequently, I am talking about classical music. Uh, and had it not been for being compromised uh, at best, uh, murdered at worst, but forced to exile somewhere in between those two uh, by the Nazi regime. So we'll go into the dynamics of that shortly, but uh, here you will, uh, here you can see, uh, you know, I think uh, there, we just went backwards, we wanna go back. So it'll take me a little while until I get, there we are, here's, a, here's our, yeah. Uh, there's Alexander Semlinsky as, as a young man. Uh, you'll see all of these men, but you will see uh, Vyacheslav Kapralova, who was a young Czech woman, who is included in this group. These are composers whose works have been sidelined, uh, were sidelined, and some of them have remained relatively uh, neglected in the years that have come. But we'll be talking all about that phenomenon and why there's also good years, good good news. Now, uh, if I back up for a moment to show you, uh, here we go, uh, William Grant Still. Now, what is this uh, coupling of William Grant Still and Alexander Zemlinsky all about? Now, uh, that's where Los Angeles Opera comes, comes in. Now, in the business, we have what we call a double bill. A double bill is when you go to the opera and you see two operas instead of one. Why is that? Because there are a lot of operas that are one act, and therefore they do not fill the entire evening. And people tend to want their money's worth, and they don't want to just come for an hour's worth of music or an hour and ten minutes' worth of music. And so the double bill has become uh, a at least a part of the environment of opera houses. Now there are famous couplings that are actually quite accidental, like Cavalleria Rusticana of Mascagni and uh, Pagliacci of Leon Cavallo. Uh, they got put together, so we affectionately call them Cav and Pag, uh, and they've they've gone through history as a, as a couple. But they can always be detached from each other. Now uh, Giacomo Puccini wrote during the First World War three operas in one night. It's called Il Trittico, which is the Italian word for triptych, and there are three operas in that case. So uh, the Zwerg, that's the name of the opera by Alexander Zemlinsky. Uh, Zwerg means dwarf in German. Now, I want, my, I want to make a disclaimer at the beginning. I do understand that we should no longer be using the term uh, dwarf to describe people who are small or short, uh, it is now definitely politically incorrect. Uh, 
and we can refer to dwarfism or to shorter, short people or a small people. But um, it's a little bit tricky talking about this opera because that is the title of the opera. And it's also his name. Uh, the character, the protagonist, doesn't have any other name. He is referred to in the opera as Zwerg, and he is addressed as Zwerg. So it's a little hard for me to completely avoid using the word, but I'll say it in German. Now you all know what it means. So I'll say it in German because at least uh, that's that should uh, slightly get around the problem. It's a little bit, a little bit like a lawyer, but uh, but that's what we'll call him Zwerg. Okay. Now uh, William Grant Still and Alexander Zemlinsky are r roughly contempor uh, contemporaneous. Their lives, that is. Uh, uh, William Grant Still was born in 1895 and died in 1978. Uh, Zemlinski was born in eight, uh, 1871, that's 24 years before that, and died in 1942, which is 35 years before Still passed away. Their music uh, is very uh, represents a great contrast. Now, so how do you what do you do as an opera producer when it comes time to do one act operas? Well, you use your imagination. Now, when we did a pr the production, the first production of uh, Der Zwerg in two thousand and eight, we coupled it with an opera by Victor Ullmann, uh, who was a, a aforementioned composer uh, who had was interned in Terezin, wrote twenty compositions there, which miraculously survived and and were found in London in the nineteen seventies. Uh, he was murdered in Auschwitz, but his music fortunately lived on. So we did a uh, we did a double bill at the time coupled with Victor Ullmann. Uh, I've done other productions of uh, of Der Zwerg, two runs of it at the Paris Opera, where we put it together with a French opera, Ravel's L'Enfant et les Sortilèges. And part of the reason was that there was a, it was a very weak link dramatically, but the music has nothing to do with one another. And But French people like to see L'Enfant et les Sortilèges, and that was one of my ways of making sure they heard Der Zwerg. And in Italy, I've done Der Zwerg once, coupled with Gianni Schicchi, Puccini's uh, great comedy, uh, in Florence. Uh, and so that is a combination that made sense to them, and so, so we did it. Now, 2024 is another time, and it, it seemed to me to be time that we present an opera by a composer who not only was American, was a black American, but also spent almost 40 years in Los Angeles, lived, taught, composed, and died in Los Angeles. This is only the second production in America of this, I should say, professional, uh, high, uh, professional uh, with a, in a large opera company of this opera, and it is a first in Los Angeles. And I thought it was time that we did that, and I will explain in a moment what the what the links between William Grant Still and uh, Alexander Zemlinsky. So uh, Isaac is there up there at the control. Isaac, can you put on the first musical excerpt? <laughs> If you've heard of anything by William Grant Still, you may have heard this piece, but this is called the Afro-American Symphony, and it is probably his most popular piece. Uh, now, just contrast that with this. This is the second excerpt, uh, uh, Isaac, so it should be number one on the list. <laughs> Uh, 
Now that should sound vaguely Spanish, but of course it's written by Alexander Zemlinsky, who was Viennese, and because the story takes place in the court of Spain, more on the story momentarily. Uh, but if we return to uh, William Grant Still, we can put on the uh, second, uh, we can put on number three, Isaac. That is Zemlinsky, and now we'll move on to number 20, please, Isaac, so you get the full sense of the contrast. second movement of this Afro-American symphony. And here's a little bit from the third movement, uh, number 21. Now that, that piece, uh, which was premiered uh, in the late 30s, uh, be was popular until the 1950s and then sort of fell out of the repertory. It's come back in the last few years in a big way, but it should give you some picture uh, of the uh, type of music that we're all missing by not listening to William Grant Still as much, much as we might. He wrote 200 works, nine operas, five symphonies, four ballets, 30 choral works, uh, art songs, chamber music, solo instrumental music. So uh, this was one of the most prolific composers of his time. He's considered, was considered, is considered, uh, uh, one of the, uh, if not the, well, the dean of black American composers. Uh, he was born in Mississippi. He moved to Little Rock, lived in Ohio and Tennessee, and in the 1920s went to New York City, lived in Harlem, and there he made the acquaintance of some of the very important uh, literary figures of the Harlem residence, uh, uh, Harlem Renaissance. And in 1935, he moved to West Adams, Sugar Hill area of Los Angeles, and there he lived until 1978. So there is William Grant Still. Here he is again. And here is a map of Harlem. Now it's upside down. Uh, I, I was uh, looking through it carefully before I started. Hang on, I'm gonna get, you, get that back. Uh, you say that through here you see Lenox Avenue, uh, seventh, uh, I don't know if there are any transplanted New Yorkers out there, as I am, uh, but this is very close to where I went to school. Uh, I used to take the uh, subway up Lenox Avenue at about 137th Street was the High School of Music and Art, where I went in the 1960s. Uh, somewhere around here, my father was born in 1910, when this area was still uh, an Irish ghetto, and he rem told me as a young boy, he remembers uh, the beginning of the influx of many black people and the grumbling that was to be heard on the part of a lot of the w white people there. But Harlem has always been an important center in culture. And so this, I think this little map here catches that 
uh, captures that. And William Grant still was exposed to uh, a lot of that in his uh, still relative youth. This is Langston Hughes, one of the uh, great luminaries of the Harlem uh, of the Harlem Renaissance, great poet, um, and you can see his years there only slightly younger than uh, William Grant still. Now, you know, our question is going to be, uh, so what's the link between Zemlinsky and, and Still? Their music has almost nothing in common. Uh, I doubt very much that Zemlinsky ever heard of William Grant Still. It's possible that Grant, William Grant Still will have heard of Zemlinsky, but maybe not even. And uh, despite the fact that their lives were basically parallel, uh, there's no... Uh, there's there's no influence or relationship in the music. Uh, so why are we pairing them? Uh, because there's an unseen link between these two men. And that unseen link uh, has to do with the fact that both of them, and bo I would say both of their, uh, the, the majority of the music they wrote is still relatively unknown or at least neglected, except for specialists. And bo for, in both cases, it was due to uh, racism. Now, that racism took very different forms. Uh, an extreme form in the case of Zemlinsky, it was the racism of the Nazi regime between 1933 and 1945, uh, genocidal in it, at its worst with um, millions of victims to that gen genocide. Uh, it dis dis disrupted uh, a great culture, moved people uh, around the world in a cruel way, caused many to emigrate, caused many to, uh, to go, go silent, many victims of the war, many victims of concentration camps, one of the catastrophes of Western civilization. Zemlinsky is a victim or was a victim of that. He fled the Nazis twice, uh, once in 1934 from Berlin back to his native Vienna, in, and then in 1938, um, at the moment of the Anschluss, when the, Nazi, uh, when the Nazi troops came in, he knew that he was to expect the worst, and he emigrated to New York City. He lived on the west side of Manhattan. He was already older in ill health, and he lived there from 1938 to 1942. In the three years that he lived there, only one of his pieces was performed, and that was a sinfonietta, was performed by the New York Philharmonic under the direction of Dimitri Metropolis, and he was too ill to attend the concert. Now, many of his colleagues, friends, and compatriots had come to the West Coast, uh, including the most important one, Arnold Schoenberg, who uh, whom Zemlinsky had taught, he's the only person that any, ever taught anything to, Alexander, uh, to uh, Arnold Schoenberg. Uh, Arnold Schoenberg was also his brother-in-law. Zemlinsky's sister, Mathilde, married uh, Schoenberg and was his first wife. More on that to come. So, meanwhile, what's the connection then with Still? Well, William Grant Still also was a victim of racism, racial injustice, and prejudice, though nothing as extreme as genocide or the Holocaust, nevertheless, he was blocked throughout his life because he was not allowed full reign to the recognition that he should have had because he was a black composer. Now, he started uh, and became very well known uh, as somebody who was a great uh, a ranger of jazz. Obviously, you can hear from his music that he is going to bring the spirit of jazz and the spirit of black America into his, into, and pour it into the mold of classical music. Uh, there are some of the most important people, and he, he will have also uh, written for all of them. Here are three of his teachers, uh, the first one less well known by us, uh, George uh, Whitefield Chadwick, uh, romantic composer from the 19th century. On the extreme l uh, left 
uh, Edgar Varese, who of course was French, uh, experimental and avant-garde, uh, taught William Grant Still. And in the middle, the man who probably did more for him than anybody else, Howard Hansen, uh, one of the great champions of 20th century music, American music in particular, a great conductor, and uh, for whom uh, Still wrote his Afro-American music. Now, here's a very important photo. William Grant Still was also the first black American com conductor to appear before a major American orchestra. And if you can look carefully, you'll probably recognize it. That is the LA Philharmonic in the Hollywood Bowl in 1936, and that is William Grant Still on the podium. So he is very much a part of Los Angeles life, and so there's, it's only fitting that we really give his music serious attention, as we feel we're doing by producing this opera, which is called Highway 1 USA. Now, this wonderful woman is, was named Verna Arve. You can see uh, her years, 1910 to 1987. She was uh, a literary figure and a, a writer and a pianist. She was the daughter of Russian Jewish immigrants. Uh, she met Still in 1929. They became romantically involved. She was to become his librettist for his operas, and she was, be uh, and he was to marry her, and they were to have two children. Uh, and one of those children, Judith Ann Still, is still alive today, and with whom I have been in a warm and generous correspondence. Now, Verna Arve actually appeared. Here's another picture of her. She actually uh, played a concert with the Los Angeles Philharmonic. And here are some of those somewhat mysterious, synchronistic, uh, I would say, coincidences uh, concerning Alexander Zemlinsky and William Grant Still. Uh, first of all, uh, daughter of Jewish immigrants. Second, she plays the piano with the Los Angeles Philharmonic, and the conductor is Otto Klemperer. Otto Klemperer, one of the titans of classical music, fled the Nazis after the 30s, came to America, uh, became was already a dynamic figure in all of music, classical music, going back to the time of Gustav Mahler, and therefore knew Zemlinsky from their early years together, came to America, spent uh, the years that were necessary to wait out to the Nazi suppression, eventually returning to Europe, but a, a legendary name. He conducted the concert, and he conducted Werner Arve um, in a piece by William Grant Still. So he, hap you know, he knew William Grant Still. He also happens to be the conductor who conducted the premiere of Der Zwerg, the Dwarf, at the Cologne Opera in 1922. So. In a mysterious way, their lives did intersect. Uh, here's a picture of the couple, William Grant Still with his wife, Verna. That's a photo from 1949. Here he is with his two children. That little one there is Judith Ann. Uh, here he is uh, for a press con conference with the Second Baptist Church a very important cultural center. And here is his home. There's a great mural based on Troubled Island, which was his one of his most important operas. We'll speak about that shortly. This mural is here in Los Angeles. Uh, this is the William Grant Still Arts Center, also in Los Angeles, which offers free and accessible concerts and, and exhibitions, music, and art classes. And it is a place where the community comes together and celebrates the arts. Uh, if you're looking for it, I have the address 2520 Southwest View Street, 
in Los Angeles, three blocks away, three blocks east of La Brea, and a half a block north of Adams. So you've probably passed it, may have noticed, may not have noticed. And here is the only existing commercial recording of Highway 1 USA. Now you can find that on YouTube, really easy. Just go on YouTube and put and push Highway 1 USA and you can hear it. Now, uh, the story of Highway 1 uh, represents some of the principles of, 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 uh, of William Grant Still. He, he, he was devoted, like one of his famous predecessors, to showing the lives of normal people. In other words, no kings and queens and czars and popes and generals and big figures in history. Uh, you and me, people like us. And this story is the story that uh, takes place in a little apartment connected to a gas station. Now, those were the days, I don't know, I can't see you because this light is blinding here, but I don't know how many of you are, are over 39 as I am, but I can still remember the gas stations where you pulled up and an, a human being came out and uh, you asked them, or her what you wanted, and they gave you gas, or they oil, or they cleaned your windshield, um, you paid them. Uh, they, it was all very personal and human in the, in the days when I was growing up uh, in the 50s and 60s. Of course, that's changed a lot. But this is a couple, a black American family, consisting of uh, a man, his wife, and the man's brother. That's the basic core and this is a domestic drama. Domestic dramas were having their day in American opera. Uh, Vanessa by Samuel Barber is a good example. Regina by Mark Blitzstein is another one. The operas of Giancarlo Benotti often were very uh, domestic, in other words, stories about families. So this is a family that has those type of family problems. Uh, and so we're gonna see uh, those problems. And, but I want to give you uh, just a sense of the music. It's very straightforward music and uh, always bringing in the spirit of uh, black America, whether it be uh, the blues or whether it be spirituals or just that uh, incredible, infectious rhythmic gift. So, Isaac, if we'll play number 22, you will hear a little bit of the chorus. Let me introduce you to Mary, uh, the beautiful, sympathetic uh, personality who is the wife. And uh, if you'll hear the, you'd have the next, uh, the next excerpt, Isaac. <laughs> Up. You could hear the great lyricism that's associated with her. So, thank you, Isaac. The problem is this, that uh, Bob, her husband, uh, made a promise to his mother on her dying bed that he would take care of his younger brother and make sure that that boy went to school and uh, was educated. For some reason, Bob was the uh, going to be the working 
per person. And Nate, his younger brother, was going to be going to school and was going to do great things. Now, the problem is Nate's gone to school. Uh, he's lived with Bob and Mary, which is putting strain on the marriage. But uh, Nate's not producing a whole lot. And Nate is sort of... Uh, sort of living off the generosity of his brother and his sister-in-law. And she's explaining to her husband uh, that that is creating a strain. Now, Bob uh, he gets to sing in a romantic uh, uh, mode himself. And that's the next ec ep excerpt, if you want to put that on, Isaac. So you can get an idea now. So the lyricism is lyricism that you can associate, and you can hear still. Uh, uh, that's not a pun. Should I find another word? You can you can hear the influences uh, of the lyric uh, of the lyric Italian operas to be found uh, even even in this work. So then um, then there comes Nate. Now, Nate is the tenor, and you, you do know most operas, the soprano loves the tenor, the tenor loves the soprano. And as George Bernard Shaw once said about Italian opera, uh, an Italian opera is where the soprano wants to make love to the tenor, the tenor wants to make love to the soprano, and the baritone doesn't want them to do that. Now, there's a little twist here. In fact, it's the baritone and the soprano who are married and love each other, and the tenor, who is the, let's say, the outsider of the triangle. And he, uh, however, like Italian tenor, uh, wants to make love to the soprano. Well, you're not supposed to do that if the soprano is married to your brother. And so this is where the conflict is going to come. But nevertheless, Nate gets some pretty romantic music. And he's a dreamer, and he, uh, he ex uh, exhibits the great belief uh, with being put into his mouth of the empowerment of dreams, something that William Grant still believe in, and we should think all the way forward to Martin Luther King and I Have a Dream. The idea of this family is based on dreams, dreams for a better life. And here you can hear Bob, of course, now, who's going to pervert that, that, that sense. Here he is. This is number, uh, number 25. I'm sorry. Here's his Nate, the brother. What does he know? says about his brother, what does he know about dreams? How can he talk of success? How can he talk of success? The honk of a horn gives him his greatest thrill. But things well of the coin they bring. Thank you, Isaac. Uh, this gives you a little touch of the kind of lyricism. William still s believed in the forms of opera, that is to say, the aria. He wanted his characters to be able to sing of their feelings, and he was a little bit against the predominant feature of declamatory, uh, declamatory opera where the, the text sort of... Uh, generated the music. Now, there's a there's a there's a, a tight relationship between the music and the text, but he definitely uh, believes in the higher power as it were of the music. This is one of the reasons that he developed this relationship with Verda because she was able to sense what he needed and he could work with her. Now, believe it or not, he actually set up uh, uh, an opera to the text of Langston Hughes. And one would say, well, that should have been awfully great. But he complained that it was actually very difficult to write 
uh, with the constraints of having to have that text and not being able to change the text. And this brings attention to a very interesting dilemma of uh, composers, and that is that sometimes the stronger the poetic text is makes composition difficult. Arnold Schoenberg, and I can't remember in which prose writing, as I read it years ago, but very accurately uh, said, the problem is this. The logic of a perfect phrase in poetry has its own laws, and the logic of a perfect phrase in music has its own laws, and those law laws compete with each other. And therefore, it is an irony that sometimes inferior poetry is actually easier to set to music. And he was using as an example Franz Schubert and all of the songs, the leader that he wrote, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of songs, and that they are the, some of the greatest songs ever written. Germans seem to feel that that's somewhat inferior poetry, but it doesn't matter you know, put together with the music of Schubert. So uh, still wanted a, uh, a text that was pliable to his music. Now here's Nate, uh, uh, just a little bit later in the opera, as he gets very amorous and starts to insist to his sister-in-law um, how wonderful she is. And we've, we've heard other famous tenors like, let's say, Pinkerton and Madame Butterfly being given beautiful music to, uh, to accompany their romantic, erotic desires, even though we think they're acting like a cad. And so Nate and Pinkerton are cousins of a sort. Uh, now, I don't want to dismiss him as easily as that. He has more depth than that. But here he is in his wooing mode. That's, this is 26, Isaac. You're wonderful, Mary. For days you've been on my mind. Your deep understanding, your sympathetic heart. Now, uh, we should uh, we should follow the development of this opera a little bit. It has a long gestation period. Uh, still started to work in 1941 on an opera called A Southern Interlude. Part of this was inspired by a famous historical moment. 19, in 1939, Marian Anderson was to have sung, uh, uh, ha have sung for the DAR, that's the Daughters of the American Revolution, in Constitution Hall in Washington, and she was to sing, My Country Tis of Thee. The Daughters of the American Revolution opposed the idea of having a black American singer, and so she sang it uh, on the mall outside of the Lincoln uh, Memorial. This will be the same site of Martin Luther King's famous I Have a Dream uh, many, many, many years later. Now, in the wake of that, uh, still starts to work on this opera, A Southern Interlude, but then he leaves it uh, until the 1960s, and then he recasts it and gives it its title, uh, which, is, uh, which is the present one, Highway 1, uh, USA. Uh, in those ensuing years, many things happened. Uh, the Supreme Court uh, outlawed uh, segregation in the public schools. Uh, the civil rights movement was uh, was becoming more and more of a uh, of a part of the American life, and so Still's life uh, m covers that long period of the development. I and mean, we're realizing uh, being born in 1895, uh, just. Uh, just you know, 30 years after the Civil War, and he will live f long enough to see some of those changes playing. And of course, his music follows that trajectory. He follows the dreams, and dreaming is important to him. He follows the dreams of uh, of many for a better a better life. Um, still, m makes a value of hard work and promises a future. Uh, for those who do work hard, in other words, the American dream. Now, 
we have to see beyond the issues of m much inequitable treatment of black persons and that even though there is education, many were still hold, held back and we still have this fight raging even in our own time. But still is a voice of hope and of dream and the dreams of freedom and his music represents that. The opera will end uh, not on a saccharine happy note, but it will be a hopeful opera in the sense that, now I'm not going to tell you the whole story because that takes the fun out of it, but at the end of the opera, Mary and Bob uh, are united uh, without the brother, without the interference of the brother, and they uh, determined that they will pursue their life and pursue their dreams. Here's the last excerpt, which is the end of the opera. So thank you, Isaac, for that. come to the opera, this is intermission, okay? Uh, uh, some of this music is very reminiscent of the, of the 50s, of movies you will have seen, uh, not far away from uh, some musical comedy, but the substance uh, is there, and uh, in it, it, it is a work of its time, uh, but one which has enormous power. I am proud that Los Angeles Opera is giving it uh, only its second production in the United States by a major opera company and the first time in Los Angeles Opera. A proud moment. Now we will move back to Zemblinsky. Now, who is that and why is that up there? I know this is an art museum, so I thought I'd bring you some art. Of course, this is one of the most famous paintings uh, in Western culture, Diego Velázquez's Las Meninas. Those are that's a Portuguese word for the ladies in waiting, and it dates back to 1656. And it is at the origin of absolutely everything about our opera, which is Der Zwerg. Now, how do we get there? How do we get from this to Alexander Zemlinsky? Well, let's first go into a little bit of Zemlinsky. This is the Stephanskirche, that is the Stephans Church in Vienna, which is a cultural monument. This is a very Viennese story. Alexander Zimlinski was born in Vienna in 1871. His, uh, his uh, mother was Jewish. His father uh, came from, uh, the, basically had to convert to Judaism to marry her, but he was a perfect mix of, the, of his Bosniak background part Muslim, part Jewish, part Christian. However, for the Nazis, he was Jewish and therefore was persecuted. His music was banned in the 30s as a part of what the, the Nazis called Antarctica Musik, that's degenerate music. Uh, I don't like to use that word. It is a historic word and therefore has a context, but that's why we call, um, or I call, the music of these composers recovered voices uh, of a term that was coined at L.A. Opera uh, some 18 or 19 years ago uh, because it's hopeful and because those voices uh, are being recovered and are being heard. And Zemlinski, and here he is, uh, still as a fairly young man. Now, any story about Zemlinski and his music has a very important personal background. Uh, that's how he looked as a young man. This is how he looked as a slightly older man. But if we return to this, the story of his music between 1900 and the 1920s is all written in the shadow of a passionate affair, a passionate love, an obsessive love he had for one of his students. And that love was reciprocated by that student. 
She's a famous person. She was a talented composer uh, and a big personality in Vienna of those years. Now, remember that picture, remember this picture, and here is that woman. Her name was Alma Schindler. She was 18 when she started studying with, uh, with Zemlinski. She was somewhat, not a lot, his junior. And they were passionately uh, attracted to each other. I'll back up. It's important to know that Zemlinski was a short person, very small. And Alma herself wrote to her diary, I don't understand how I can be so attracted to this man. He is ugly. He has no chin. You can take a good look at it. You can see that. He is so small that when we walk in the park, he only comes up to my shoulders. However, he is so charismatic, so intelligent, so inspiring that I cannot resist him. Now you can understand why an opera about a short person and also an ugly person had an appeal to Zemlinski because he is, of course, the protagonist. So there he is again, and there she is. Now, Zemlinski probably was the first full love affair, although she never confided whether it was consummated. I think we can assume it was, uh, but she was discreet and didn't even tell her diary. She didn't want her mother to know. She did tell her diary that Gustav Klimt had kissed her on the lips, now, as you will see, she will have a great appeal and a great attraction to geniuses. There she is in a portrait looking very much like a Klimt painting. Compare her with Alexander Zemlinsky. And here's the man she married. Now, what happened? She uh, went to a party. Uh, happened to meet Gustav Mahler and said, you know, my acquaintance Alexander Zemlinski sent you some of his music and you never answered him. And so she upbraided Gustav Mahler. What was the upshot of that evening? Uh, within two months, Mahler had fallen in love with her and married her and she with Mahler. She uh, dismissed Alexander Zemlinski unceremoniously, and remember that fact for our opera, he was heartbroken, and he was to react for many years in the shadow of that rejection. Now, just to give you a little more context, and then we'll get back to the story, uh, this family is the Schoenberg family. Uh, I don't know if Ron Schoenberg is back there or anywhere in the, in, the, in, the, in the shadows there with Barbara Tysel, his wife, uh, also daughter of one of the one of the composers who we consider recovered voices. They both came to, both of their fathers came to Los Angeles and made their great contribution to American music uh, and still live to this day in the same house. But there's the younger Arnold Schoenberg with his first wife, who is the sister of Zemlinski. Her name was Matilda, and there are two children. There uh, on the left, Zemlinski with Arnold Schoenberg. They were friends for their entire lives, although they had their rough moments because Zemlinski rejected one of the basic, basic tenets of Schoenberg's theories, and that was 12-tone music. Schoenberg resented it. Zemlinski uh, was a man who would not change his opinions for anybody, and so they argued. But th it was, in fact, a faithful friendship. Schoenberg was to write twice in his life that he considered Alexander Zemlinski one of the great composers, once in 1921 and once in the late 1940s, shortly before his own death, after the death of Zemlinski. He said, I always considered him a great composer, and I still do, and in fact, I th consider him after Wagner and Strauss the greatest composer of uh, music for the theater, meaning opera. Um, Alma Schindler Mahler 
passed through several relationships. Uh, apparently, Oscar Kokoschka was one of them. Uh, we might say they dated. I don't know what other uh, term to use. Uh, not a significant relationship, but ultimately, uh, I think I've lost one picture in this. Uh, yeah, Walter Gropius became her second husband. Uh, she had an affair with him before Mahler's death, and then the third was Franz Werfel, uh, and he moved to her to Beverly Hills in, 19, for, in the 1940s, uh, 1930s, 1940s. He died here. Here she is with Werfel. And now we're going to change our focus. Here's Oscar Wilde. What is Oscar Wilde doing here? The great Irish poet, writer, born in Dublin in 1854. You will see he dies as a young man in 1900. Uh, here he is, flamboyant personality, one of the great writers in the English language. So what does he have to do with the, the Zwerg? Well, you have seen Las Meninas. Now, I'll remind you what it looks like. Uh, and he, having seen that painting, wrote a short story, and he calls that short story A Birthday for the Infanta. Now, the birthday for the Infanta is going to have a life of its own. It's going to form the basis of a ballet by Franz Schreker, another composer. Uh, and who was a friend of Zemlinsky and a colleague of Zemlinsky, and it's going to form the basis of the first opera of what I call the Oscar Wilde trilogy by this composer, Richard Strauss. And the opera is Zalome. Now, that's a picture of Zalome from 1909 by Gustav Klimt. Strauss writes his opera, word-for-word -word translation into German, in 1905. Now, it's important to remember that Oscar Wilde was the victim also of, of an injustice. He was condemned in court for homosexuality, uh, a rather hypocritical claim uh, in a world uh, which, of course, uh, there, were, there was much homosexuality, but was against the law, and he spent two years in prison, which broke his morale and broke his body. And that is why, after he got out of jail, he moved to Paris, and he died there, still a very young man. His works were banned in the Anglo-Saxon countries. That means England and America, one could not publish, and one was not supposed to read Oscar Wilde. However, the Germans latched on to him, started translating his works, and Zalome, which, by the way, was written in French, uh, was translated into German. Zalome, uh, Strauss becomes the second composer in his period to take a word-for-word -word translation of a play. The first one we discussed a year ago, I think when I was here, was Maurice Maeterlinck's Peleas and Melisande. It was not normal in those days to write, take, a, take a text from a play and write word for word an opera to that text. But Strauss becomes the second one. Zalome is a great success. And very importantly, Alexander Zemlinsky conducted, and he was a great conductor, he conducted the premiere of that Zalome in Vienna. I should say the Viennese premiere. It was not the first performance. So uh, here's something from the uh, poster 1910 from that period of Zalome. Now, th this opened the door to Zemlinsky to the possibility of using other works by Oscar Wilde. And he focused on a, a posthumous work, a, per a work that was found amongst Oscar Wilde's papers after his death, called A Florentine Tragedy. A Florentine Tragedy has a very, uh, very complex, twisted plot, uh, and a, it is also a one-act opera, just like Zalome. And so Strauss, who now was, uh, um, Zemlinsky, who was thoroughly conversant in the language of Strauss, will convert uh, what he learns from that and create 
I believe, one of the great operas of the 20th century. An opera, by the way, which was seen and heard by Alban Berg, and one can, one, first of all, we know that he admired it, and we can also see, uh, for those who love and know Wozzeck, we can also see the, uh, the, the ideas and links that go from Zemlinsky to Berg. So, amongst everything else, we, we, it's good for us to understand that Zemlinsky was so respected by Schoenberg, by Anton Webern, by uh, Alban Berg, and so many of the composers of his time, it is a tragedy that his later life, uh, through the Nazi suppression, was able to take him off the radar of the world. Uh, I don't have any pictures of the Florentine tragedy, but uh, this is a cover of a recording I made of the Florentine tragedy in Cologne, in Germany, when I was music director there. Uh, and it's an opera I highly recommend. It is also a one-act opera. Uh, I have also done it as a double bill, uh, also with Johnny Skiki at La Scala. Uh, uh, it is a great curtain riser for anything else you want to put with it. I mean, if I could put it together with Pagliacci, I would. If I could put it together with Cavalleria, if I could tear Cav and Pag away from each other, uh, I would do it. It is a worthwhile opera, and it's going to be a very important link in this Oscar Wilde trilogy. Now, here's a, an, a picture of, uh, this is the cover of a uh, recording. You can hear this recording on uh, YouTube. You don't have to go out and buy it. Just go on YouTube, put James Conlon, Detzwerg, Zemlinski, James Conlon, Detzwerg. You'll find two different copies of it. Uh, one which will be uh, will look something like this, and the other one which doesn't have my name on it, but it's actually uh, beautiful and uninterrupted. It has a nice blue cover. YouTube is a treasure chest. You can find it all right there. So now the Zwerg becomes, in my mind, the third of the trilogy of one-act Oscar Wilde operas. Let's contrast them and let's see what the thread is. The thread is very important. It is a intellectual thread. Zalame, word-for-word translation. Florentine tragedy, word-for-word translation. Zwerg freely adapted from the, the birthday for the Infanta. What is the link? It is a fascination with beauty and its meaning. Now, Oscar Wilde was to come back to this theme over and over in his writings. The contrast between and the meaning of outer beauty and inner substance. And he will show us quite often outward beauty and inner corruption. And then sometimes he will show us outward ugliness but inner beauty. Now, for those of you who are fans of the picture of Dorian Gray, uh, obviously that, uh, that obsession with the beaut this beautiful man but his corrupt personality is very essential to that drama. But if you think of the story of Zalome, she is a princess, outwardly beautiful, inwardly corrupt. Who does she love? She loves John the Baptist, Yohanaan, as he's referred to in the opera and the play. And he is what? Outwardly ugly, uh, or at least unkempt. He's been living in that cistern for too long. And inwardly spiritual. She's attracted to him because he, she senses a spiritual reality that she's never seen around her. So we have that contrast. Inner beauty, inner, uh, inner beauty, outward ugliness, outer beauty, inward ugliness. We're going to revisit it again in the Florentine tragedy. The character, there is a, once again, a triangle opera where the tenor and the soprano are the adulterous couple and the husband of the soprano is the baritone. He surprises them at home and the whole drama is about how he outwits the beautiful uh, aristocratic lover of his wife and kills him. So that well, there again we have the soprano whose name is Bianca, meaning white. Uh, she is outwardly beautiful, but at least in the sense that she's in this adulterous relationship, there's some corruption. Uh, the the uh, aristocrat is used to that kind of behavior, and he is in, in his way corrupt. And the hardworking, laboring 
salesman, who the husband is, is ugly and unattractive and gruff, but he's smarter. And so, again, we're putting Zemlinsky in the, in the character of the husband uh, with the beautiful wife. Both of those are shadows for him of, as we're going to see now in the Zwerg, of Alma Mahler. Alma is the beautiful, unattainable woman, and the poor Zemlinsky is the victim of that. Now, Zemlinsky was so obsessed in the getting close to 1910 with this problem of his own ugliness, he goes to his colleague and friend, Franz Schreker, the composer, and asks him, write me the story, the libretto of an ugly man. This is Franz Schreker, and that opera over there, Die Gezeichneten, called The Stigmatized, you can see the L.A. Opera production. This was the first, we did the first production of any Schreker opera in the United States, at the first stage production. This is what came out of that libretto. Schreker kept it for himself. He didn't want to give it away to Zimlinski. Zimlinski, to be honest, didn't want it after he had asked for it. And so it became this extraordinary opera. Now, just a quick bunch of portraits. Schoenberg liked to paint. He was a very fine painter. That's his self-portrait. Here's his portrait of Zemlinsky. Uh, these are various photos to give you some cultural back. This is the Sephardic synagogue in Vienna uh, where Zemlinsky's father was associated. Uh, that is his father uh, and mother, and there is Zimlinski as a small child. Uh, here he is rehearsing in Prague, where he was the music director of the opera for 16 years. There he is with Kurt Weill uh, in Berlin before they emigrated, and there he is in 1932. Here is his second wife, Louise Zimlinski. She was to live uh, into the late... Um, trying to remember the date, late 80s, early 90s. It lived in New York. I could slit my wrists because she was there the whole time I was growing up, and I had never heard of Alexander Zemlinsky, and I can assure you that had I, I would have made an effort to meet her. That is the house in which he died in Larchmont, New York. And here we are. We're back to Las Meninas, and here's the story. And we're going to take you run quickly through the music to give you an idea of what you're about to hear. Now, there are uh, we are in this court. Look at that painting carefully. You will see a young lady in the middle. That is the Infanta. You'll see she has two uh, ladies in waiting on her side. They're called Las Meninas. Those ladies in waiting will be in the opera. And you'll see in the right corner a short person, or it's Sverk. And that will be at the beginning of the uh, conception of a birthday for the Infanta and consequently Zimlinski Tzver. Uh, on the left, looking toward us, is Velasquez in a self-portrait. You can see he has, if you can, if you can see it well enough, you can see that he, let me see if I can get this, yeah, he's holding his palette there. This is his canvas. And in the mirror there are are the parents, the king and the queen. That's King Philip IV. And in the doorway is a sort of maitre d', major domo. Uh, uh, the infanta, the two ladies in waiting, the major domo, and not this particular uh, short person make their way into the story of the birthday of the infanta. Now, here's another picture of uh, Velázquez. Velázquez made a whole series of paintings of short persons uh, in the court of Philip IV. Oscar Wilde presumably saw all of them. Here's a picture from our production, which we will be bringing to you when we open on February the 24th, and that's Roderick Dixon, who is playing the dwarf, or the Zwerg. And here he is with the Infanta. So let's listen to the first excerpt, which is going to show us that we are in Spain, if there's any mistake about it. So we're back to number one, please, Isaac. <laughs> So we're 
setting the scene. Now we move to the second ex excerpt, and we can hear uh, the beauty and sensuousness of this music. This is a character you can keep playing, Isaac. This is a, uh, a character named Gita, who is the only sympathetic member of the court. She takes a great liking and has a great sympathy for our short person when he arrives in the scene. Now, here's a third excerpt. This is to give you a picture of those ladies in waiting. The elegance and delicacy of the music is very important. Okay, now, here's the crux of the story. It is the birthday, and the Infanta, being the daughter of the King of Spain, is given presents from everybody, from the Pope to all sorts of local potentates. And amongst those gifts from a particular sultan, she receives this little man, the Zwerg, as a gift to her to play with, because in the court, that's what was done. Now, we have another famous case of that in opera literature, and that is Rigoletto. Remember that Rigoletto is a small, hunchbacked person, and he, uh, Verdi, took a revolutionary step in presenting him as a protagonist and as a, as a, a character with whom we can have sympathy. Zemlinski will do the same thing. He will bring this ugly, misshapen, distorted little person who is ugly on the outside but has the soul of a poet, of a humanist, of generosity, of love. And so we get that same theme again. And of course, that's going to make Zemlinsky the Zwerg, and it's going to make Alma again the unattainable object, the beautiful, elegant woman whom he can over, uh, cannot have um, to he, with whom he can not spend his life. Now, the there are two musical motives. The first one, and I said you want to, you may want to raise the level here a little bit so that people can hear this carefully. This is a description of the Zwerg, how he walks and how he uh, and how he looks. So this is number four. Listen to the orchestra. The grotesque. You can hear him galumphing around with his awkward gait. Now, Zemlinski also gives us a second motive for the Zwerg, which is his soul. And we see that his soul is deep, is expressive, is human, is melancholy. Here it is, number five. Der Sultan Sante. And here it comes. So, he's given us the exterior and the interior of the sphere in two motives that will be used throughout the opera. Now we'll get a sense of the incredible expression of the Zwerg when he sings. Number six. And now a very important moment. This is one of the most beautiful moments in the opera. We're going to stop this one. We're, going to, we're about to start the next one now. This is uh, the moment that the Infanta has dismissed everybody in the court because she wants to be alone uh, with the Zwerg, and they converse for the first time. He is fully in love by now, and she's at least she's fascinated with him, and she plays with him. She, uh, but you can you can feel the underlying romance of the scene, and I think amongst the falling in love scenes that are famous in opera, uh, like the first act of La Boheme, Mimi and Rodolfo meet each other, or the presentation of the rose in the second act of De Rose and Cavalier, I think this is one of the most extraordinary moments in opera, the beautiful conversation between the Infanta and the Zwerg. We'll play you a little bit of this. 
Number seven. You may want to raise the volume, Isaac. to number nine. If you want to hear the end of that phrase, you have to go on YouTube, and then you have to come to Los Angeles Opera and hear it and see it. Uh, we're going to move to number nine. This is the, the Zwerg responding to her. Number nine. It becomes too ardent for her. And she says, not so fast, my friend. And now she will go off, thank you, Isaac, she's going to go off to dance with her friends. Uh, now, now comes the crux of the entire story. The, that crux is, revolves around the image of the Zwerg. He has grown up in the wilderness, and therefore he has never been at a court. He has never seen a mirror. He has never seen himself. He does not understand that he is ugly and misshapen. And he has this beautiful, innocent, and optimistic and generous character. But he's always been slightly afraid of certain things. He's seen his enemy follow him when he has his sword in his hand. That, of course, he sees his own reflection in the sword, but he doesn't understand that it's him. And if he looks in the water, he'll see, like Narcissus, he will see the reflection. This is going, this is Oscar Wilde here. He does not understand how he looks. He only understands how he is. And he knows that people laugh when they see him, and he seems to think he makes people happy, and therefore uh, they are happy because, they, because he brings love to everybody, which is what he wants to do. Now he will see himself in the mirror, and he will be horrified, and we'll hear that horrifying um, uh, moment at... Number 12, Isaac. Oh, I'm sorry. It's number... Oh, sorry, it's number 13. This is the moment his self-image is shattered. Okay, now he will uh, uh, he will clutch a white rose that she has given to him. We'll play number fourteen. This music that sounds like Tristan and Isolde. Okay, thank you, Isaac. Now, she, of course, uh, at this point, she says, you know, I, I want to dance with you. I want to play with you, but you can only, well, I can only love a human being, and you are like an animal. Now it gets cruel, and here we are at number fifteen. And that is the great, thank you, 
Isaac, and that is the great tragic moment where she rejects him, and she goes off. Uh, we're going to go into uh, number 17. Well, uh, she will go off indifferently at the end of all of this. Number 17, Isaac. Geschenkt und schon she says, geschenkt und schon verdorben. My present, it's already broken. My toy for my 18th birthday. He's on the ground suffering. Indifferent. Okay. I'm going back to the dance. And off she goes. So here, thank you, Isaac. Here is where we see Alma Mahler, Almer, and Zimlinski. In other words, she dropped him unceremoniously, and he has remained with his broken heart. So here, we, he's recounting, uh, he's recounting this very per in this very personal way. So the last excerpt is, uh, he is, uh, you know, it, typical of many operas. You can die of a broken heart. He will die of a broken heart, but he's had a broken image. And the Wildean message is the following. Contrary to the old Greek maxim, know thyself, Wilde asks us, and so does Zimlinski, is it perhaps not better that we do not know ourselves? And this is a tragedy of somebody who, upon discovering himself, is shattered and his life is shattered. Here's the last excerpt. to give him give me the white rose and he clutches it and he dies unceremoniously with a thud there it was that was it and all we hear ironically is the dance music from the next room With that shocking ending, the opera ends. And with that shock, I'm ending my speech and my presentation. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Uh, I did, uh, now I did offer to do, uh, here's some questions, I had a little Q&A. Uh, I ran over a little bit of time, so uh, there's two ways to do this, and um, some, someone from the staff can decide. If you'd like to do uh, you know, a few questions here, we can do that. Uh, I could ask you, any question is fine. I know very often when I speak, uh, I'm always surprised by the questions because they have nothing to do with what I said. Uh, but you're, you're willing to ask questions, but please, please, no discourses and no speeches. But we, we prefer questions to affirmations. And then I will be coming to the reception so that if you're going there, I'll be very happy to uh, answer any of your questions. So uh, what's, the word from, uh, what's the word from the staff? Yes, okay. Right. Okay. Somebody from the staff will be choosing. Thank you so much for a rainy afternoon. This was really, really wonderful. I really appreciate it. Um, I noticed on the cover of Highway One that it was performed by the St. Olaf Orchestra. And I'm curious, is that the St. Olaf Orchestra in Minnesota? And if so, it just seems quite interesting that they would have picked up um, that piece, or was it another orchestra? You know, I, you. I actually, thank you for the question. I actually, good, good eye, and I actually don't know the answer to that question. All I know is that this is the only recording that was ever made of the work, um, and I don't know much about the history of how it came to be. 
Uh, so uh, hopefully that's going to change. Hopefully there are going to be more. Uh, so maybe you can help me find out. More questions? A deep silence. <laughs> As I wasn't able to get to the uh, program yesterday. So uh, can I'm you hold the microphone close to your mouth, please? I'm curious about the season that was announced yesterday. Uh, well, you can find you can find that all on our website, uh, well, LA Opera website, and I'll be happy to talk to you personally about it if uh, if you want. But I would like to use the time to talk about our double bill. Uh, if you go on our website, you uh, can find, in addition to lots of information about uh, the Zwerg and the Highway One, I have written an article. It's called. Uh, exiled to America, exiled in America, and it is uh, an essay that is devoted to explaining uh, some of what I was able to touch on, but uh, not in depth, uh, about these two operas being put together. Um, I also recommend if you go on t on uh, on the website, the OrelFoundation.org. That's O R E L meaning light of God in Hebrew, you can find information on about two dozen composers who are were the recovered voices composed, that you saw at the beginning on that subject. So the uh, this is a, a website that I uh, founded some, well, it's almost 20 years ago. Uh, in order to be a resource, when I came back from Europe in the early, uh, right after the millennium, and started doing a lot of these pieces with orchestras around the country. People invariably ask me, uh, "How can I find out more about this subject?" And I said, "I'm, you know, I'm really sorry to tell you, there's not a lot of information out there because almost nothing had been available and written in English. Most of the literature about th these composers and their histories was written in German and not available to in people in America. So I determined to make this." this website. Now, it's called Orel Foundation. We are not a foundation. D please don't write and ask for money. We're a foundation that needs money. We're not one that has money. But oh, that's just the title. Uh, and now it can be also located by going through the Searing uh, Conlon Initiative at the Colburn School. Marilyn Searing was the great angel and sponsor to our early efforts to establish recovered voices as a presence here in Los Angeles. So that's Searing Conlon Initiative, and you can find it through the Colburn uh, School uh, website. Why is it that Z Zemlinsky had no success in the United States or had so little success in the United States? Well, first of all, we have to consider that he was uh, in ill health and almost 70 years old, which in those days was old, when he arrived. He didn't speak English. He was isolated. He was broken. Uh, you know, we think of the composers who emigrated as being the lucky ones to escape being murdered, but they did not have easy lives. Emigration, immigration, is a very difficult thing. Now, the brain drain out of Germany was brain gain for America. We benefited from the, uh, the musicians, the professors, the composers, the writers, the medical, the doctors, the scientists. We were fortunate in this country in, uh, to the degree we welcomed these immigrants. We were fortunate. I mean, it wasn't easy for every, any, anybody, but we, we gained a great deal. We owe a great deal of our cultural, uh, cultural wealth to two immigrations early, after both world wars. 
he just uh, he just came. It was you know it was a question of age, question of ill health, and he really had no contacts. Most of his close colleagues came here to Southern California, to Los Angeles, to Hollywood. Schoenberg lived just you know a few miles from where we're standing right now. Uh, those were the people he knew and who knew him. He he went to New York City and was basically isolated. That is a lot of the reason that it took, you know, it took so long for him to be rediscovered here in America. And a lot of the, a lot of the credit goes to the LaSalle String Quartet, who actually found and caused the four quartets that he wrote to be published and recorded them for Deutsche Grammophon. And in the course of the next two weeks and some of my other uh, evenings that I'm curating, or some afternoons, that is also, uh, we'll be performing all four of those quartets, uh, two of them with string quartets from the Colburn School, and two of those quartets played by my principal uh, string soloists from Los Angeles Opera. I may be dreaming but it sounded for a moment to me at the uh, beginning of the overture, I thought, this reminds me of the overture of Candide. It was fleeting, but I thought I heard it. And I wondered, I know that there's a trajectory from Mahler to Bruno Walter to Leonard Bernstein. Would Bernstein have known Zemlinsky? Would he have known his music? Are you aware of this at all? I would doubt that he knew him. It is possible, but uh, you know, Zemlinsky was so marginal during the great years of Bernstein that it's possible that he didn't. I'm sure he knew his name. There, there's no way he couldn't have because of his proximity to Mahler. Uh, but as some uh, I, I wasn't able to get into the story about what was the prejudice against the composers who actually emigrated, uh, what was the prejudice against them that held them held back their reputations after the war. In, I was fortunate to be in Germany when I discovered all of this music for myself in the 1990s, and there were a lot of musicologists and a lot of musicians who knew a lot about it. And they had a saying there. They said, these, these, these composers were murdered twice during their lifetime and a second time in the post-war period. And what was it that they meant by they were murdered a second time was that the orthodoxy of two schools, one was uh, from one of their own, which was Arnold Schoenberg, the orthodoxy of 12-tone music was so strong that if you did not write in that vein, you were considered not worthy of any attention. The other one was the electronic music, as that got started, particularly with Karl-Heinz Stockhausen. Uh, and this blocked academia in the German-speaking countries, and also in America to some degree, for at least 20 years. It wasn't until the 1970s, really, that people were sticking their heads up and saying, oh, wait a minute, there, was, there were other things. Now, Zimlinski had taken a, a firm stand against 12-tone music, and I think that was one of the reasons that uh, his music wasn't considered at all. Another problem for all of these composers was that the people, many of the musicians that knew them were dead. You know, think about that, that they're you know, growing and performing in the teens, in the 20s, in the early 30s. Uh, so many of their colleagues had been murdered in concentration camps, had been silenced, had been forced to leave. And then there was a great diaspora of musicians. Nobody was going to stick their head up a lot of those immigrants were still afraid. They were still afraid of anti-Semitism. They were still afraid after their experience. Uh, they, they were just very glad to have survived and were doing the best they could in where, you know, wherever they happened to go. And then it should also not be forgotten that in Germany and in Austria and perhaps... Uh, well, I'm going to not say perhaps, but also in Prague and Budapest, which are all the important centers. Many of the survivors were not Jewish and were still anti-Semitic. 
they may not have said so out loud, but so a lot of the, um, uh, uh, you know, a lot of the, a lot of those leftovers did not make a conducive atmosphere for the defense of the composers that might have had defenders if the defenders were alive or if they were in situations where they felt safe in defending them. It is a great question of mine why conductors like Bruno Walter and Otto Klemperer did as little as they did. And here, uh, there's, there's, there's nothing documented. I only have my own private theories. Uh, one, I happen to know that Bruno Walter was very jealous of Zemlinski, uh, going back to the time that Mahler asked Zemlinski to put his Sixth Symphony uh, in a form of, of a piano, to two piano version. And Bruno Walter resented that. And uh, I think he resented Zemlinski, and he also never conducted the Mahler Sixth Symphony. Amazing, considering how many of the symphonies that Mahler that, that Bruno Walter conducted. So, you know, we also have to remember these are human beings, and uh, they were, they were uh, subject to jealousies and competitive feelings and all of that. So uh, I, I would say as an overall, overall answer, the atmosphere of post-war Germany and America and England was not conducive with memorializing people uh, who had been uh, victimized. And, of course, that... Very much includes Zemlinski. Thank you for the question. I think I just got my cue. So it's it's to the reception. As the Infanta says, let's go back to the dance. We'll see you at the reception. Thank you so much for coming.